Good morning and welcome to yet another very important of the dialogue series by the national, the NCCE. And as you have followed the NCCE, they have been playing a major and very important part in making sure that you are fully educated about what is going on as far as coronavirus is concerned. This is yet another occasion where the NCC not only engages you, but seeks to bring you expert education and advice as to how to conduct your life. Once again, welcome. This is the fifth national dialogue. It's done each quarter and based on research that is conducted by the organization with a constitutional mandate to give you education. So welcome to the fifth Arab national dialogue by the NCCE. You can find us, hashtag NCC Dialogue on Joy. Hashtag NCC Dialogue on Joy. Thank you all so very much. We will straight away get to hear from the NCCE's chairperson and a few other very important stakeholders in this morning's dialogue. So let's begin by having an address by Ms. Josephine Nkrumah, who is the chairperson of the NCCE. Hello, welcome, Ms. Joseph, Josephine Nkrumah. Well, thank you very much, Samson. Great. So let's hear you right away. Why is today yet another important um, occasion for all of us as Ghanaians tuning to the NCCE's Fifth Arab National Dialogue? Distinguished virtual audience, good morning. As we all know, in the last six months, our world has changed, perhaps irrevocably. However, the resilience of the human spirit ensures that we continue to pursue our objectives, both as individuals and organizations. It is on this note that I welcome you to the NCCE's fifth dialogue in our accountability, rule of law, anti-corruption, and environmental governance dialogue series. This fifth dialogue focuses on good environmental governance and the coronavirus pandemic. Whilst we continue to grapple with the immediate charge of containing the spread of the virus and saving lives, we must remain alive to other adverse impacts of the pandemic. COVID-19 undoubtedly highlights the essential role of plastics in our daily lives. Disposable masks, PPEs, gloves, and other essentials to ensure we minimize infections across the broad spectrum of activities of living and working. There is a surge in the demand for plastics with the resultant issue of sustainable waste management, including medical waste. More worrying is the growing challenge of handling waste, particularly where it is alleged that in certain suburbs, people are collecting used masks and washing them for resale. In certain communities, young children are vulnerable as they play with indiscriminately disposed masks, gloves, etc. We need a dynamically responsive waste management system that takes into account proper segregation of household and workplace waste 
particularly due to the potential or real infectious nature of such waste. How are our public institutions and public-private partnerships responding to these challenges? And how are we, the citizenry, playing an effective role in these matters? At the end of this dialogue, it is our expectation that our takeaway will encourage us all to adopt a more environmentally sustainable lifestyle, uphold the value of integrity, even as we are challenged to demand accountability from institutions operating in the environmental governance sector. As we deliberate on these issues, we should, as a country, be upscaling our green financing models that tackle issues of deforestation, sustainable environmental business models that can address the surge in unemployment Right, so a bit of technology difficulties there, but I'm sure that um, we should have that uh, quickly rectified. And then um, uh, Ms. Josephine Krumer uh, can finish up with her welcome address. But she's done substantially um, what she needs to bring all of us on board to get to understand about today. It is the fifth virtual Arab National Dialogue. The theme is Good Environmental Governance and the Coronavirus Pandemic. We have experts who will help us to understand what is going on and how we need in the midst of the pandemic to take care of the environment in a way that we don't unnecessarily get into the risk of getting infected. Um, if uh, Ms. Cromer's you know, line is clear and clean now, can we have you uh, finish up your address? Okay, so we're trying to get that uh, immediately sorted. And once that is done, uh, we, will, we, will, we will have her. And once again, don't forget, this is the National Commission for Civic Education's um, uh, quarterly dialogue is a national dialogue based on empirical evidence brought from research that the NCCE uh, gathers. Let's have the chairperson of the NCCE conclude her welcome remarks. Well, as, as I was saying, as we deliberate on these issues, we should, as a country, be scaling up our green financing models that tackle issues of deforestation, sustainable environmental business models that can address the surge in unemployment and the widening socioeconomic inequality in society, particularly for women entrepreneurs in the wake of this global pandemic. I take this opportunity to thank our moderator, Samson, and the panelists for joining us for this dialogue as we explore critical issues of environmental governance in the wake of coronavirus. Of course, this dialogue would not be made possible without our funding partner, the European Union, as well as our media partner, the Multimedia Group. The Commission is indeed grateful and cherishes these partnerships we have built over the years. I look forward to an informative and insightful dialogue. Thank you very much. Over to you, Samson. Thank you very much. Ms. Josephine Krumer is the chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education, the NCCE. And the NCCE has been playing such a very important role in making sure that you get the needed education about the coronavirus pandemic so that you can reduce the risk uh, of contacting the virus. And as she just mentioned, this is made possible by uh, their partners, the European Union. And this is always done uh, in partnership with the uh, Accountability Rule of Law and Anti-Corruption Program, ARA. Now, as she mentioned, the European Union is a very significant partner in this. Shall we, at this point, welcome the head of the EU delegation to Ghana, Her Excellency 
Diana Aconcia for her statements. We would first have to have the EU delegation, the head of the EU delegation to Ghana, Her Excellency Dina Aconcia. Right. In the meantime, whilst we get ready to have her, let's have Mr. John uh, Poimang, who is the acting executive secretary of the um, EPA, the institution that is critical to ensuring that our environment is clean for our protection for his remarks. Hello, Mr. Poimang. Yes, thank you very much, uh, moderator and um, your panelist, the chairman of the National Commission for Civic Ed Education the head of the EU delegation and the representative of the Arab program. The multimedia group, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for the EPA to make some remarks on this uh, you know, occasion of the fifth dialogue on environmental governance, which focuses on uh, environmental governance and the COVID-19 you no know, pandemic. Uh, you will agree that uh, you know, since 1992, when uh, you know, with the Rio declaration was made, many countries all over the world, you know, set up uh, environmental governance institutions. And in Ghana, you know, the EPC at that time was set up, you know, and then finally it became the Environmental Protection Agency, you know, to among other things, coordinate environmental governance activities in Ghana. And we are glad that uh, you know, groups like the Arab and the multimedia group are collaborating with us you know, to bring this uh, critical issue, you know, to national attention. That is the way with the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, is affecting environmental governance. You know, we, as uh, people, we have failed to recognize that, you know, the, at the end of the day, the help of the people, you know, depends, you know, largely on... Okay, so we are getting a bit of a difficulty with Mr. John Poamang, the executive director of the Environmental Protection uh, Agency's also um, line, but I understand that he is clear now. Uh, so, Mr. Poamang, you can continue. All right, thank you. And uh, mostly due to our human activities that we have been in terms of deforestation, you know, intensive agriculture. You know, on safe management and then consumption of wildlife and natural resources. These are what we are doing to undermine the ecosystems, you know, that are there to protect us. You know, the COVID-19 crisis, you know, was caused, you know, by a combination of harmful interactions between humans and wildlife. And then also, you know, the accelerated movements of people and goods across borders. You know, this, uh, you know, the interaction between humans and wildlife, you know, led to the spread of the disease but also the movement, you know, large movements of people using, you know, air travel and other forms of movement caused the disease to, to spread very quickly, you know, to pandemic I mean, proportions. So we, have to, have, we as a people have to look at what, you know, we are doing that is causing all these uh, pandemics. And I think in the history, we can recount so many of such types of pandemics. But while the COVID-19, you know, pandemic is tragic, tragically affecting people's health, lives and livelihood. It has also noticeable, noticeable positive impacts in, the, in that due to the restrictions that are being imposed to control the spread of the disease, you know, movement of vehicles and so forth are reduced. And so air pollution has uh, sort of uh, improved a little bit, you know, not so you know, significantly, but at least there's some marginal improvement in air pollution due to people not uh, moving so much. And also industries, not producing at uh, you know uh, optimal levels, but we also know that the the pandemic has brought in this week other forms of uh, you know other types of environmental problems, notably you know the waste that are generated, healthcare waste. We have got different types of healthcare waste which are emanating now, and also you know the face masks, the disposable face masks that we have to deal with, as well as the, the numerous plastics that are used you know to 
contain the hand sanitizers that we are all using. You know, we also have a lot of disinfection going on using chemicals, and some of these, you know, have got the uh, undesirable side effects. So these are also some adverse effects of the, mm -hmm. you know, pandemic that we can uh, talk of. But uh, we have to realize that in the short term, we need to have some very strong systems in place to manage the healthcare waste that are emanating from the control of this uh, pandemic. And for this, you know, the uh, waste collection companies or even all the various individuals, you know, have to take steps to make sure that, you know, the used masks are not disposed of, you know, anyhow. These are ways which are potentially, you know, infectious. And so we need to make sure that we dispose of them properly. And also we need to change our lifestyles. Now we are doing this conference, you know, using, you know, a Zoom application. We would have met together somewhere in a hotel to do this program. But now we all have to make sure that we get uh, we get used to this type of uh, programs that we do you know things in this in this manner and going forward we need to make sure that we change our lifestyles to suit the way the pandemic has brought us to this point and then as we go along many countries including Ghana are taking steps to try to you know improve upon the economy by coming up with some you know packages too and in doing these packages we need to make sure that we are doing the packages to try to get industries to come back using green, you know, economy uh, principles, not to go on in the same way that we used to do, you know, with polluting and so forth. Industries, you know, as they go on to try to, you know, revamp themselves, should go through the green, uh, you know, uh, the route so that we can control, you know, environmental damages that we are causing, some of which have led to this uh, pandemic. So on this note, we thank the Arab, you know, for supporting you know, this uh, dialogue and also the multimedia group for providing the forum for us to participate, the uh, National Commission for Civic Education. And we look forward to the, you know, panelists and then the, the rest of the program. Thank you so much. Very much indeed. Um, Mr. John Poimang, who is the executive director of the Environmental Protection Agency and who has always been available, uh, particularly when the NCCE has to give education on environmental issues. And please don't forget, today we are looking at good environmental governance and the coronavirus pandemic. Good environmental governance and the coronavirus pandemic. This is the fifth Arab National Dialogue by the NCCE. So now we will get straight into getting some education, getting to discuss the matters that, that really matter. So we will all be assisted in how we ought to handle our waste so that we reduce the risk of infections. And here in the studio to help us do this discussion is our Dr. Imanolo Dami, who is the Director of Policy Planning Monitoring and evaluation at the Ministry of Health. Doc, thank you very much for making thank time you. to be with us on this uh, dialogue. Thank you, Samson. Great. And also is uh, Sanam Tenge, who is, the, who is an engineer and manager, medical waste department of Zoom Lion, the biggest, the biggest uh, waste management institution when it comes to this country and even some parts of the part of uh, African West Africa, uh, they have such a big name in helping to uh, take care of our environment. Thank you very much for joining us, Sanam. It's a pleasure, there, Samson. Right, we will be joined on Zoom uh, by uh, Mr. Franklin Kujo, who is president of Imani Africa. So, Mr. Franklin Kujo should join us sometime shortly. But as you know, we are looking at the environmental situations, COVID-19, um, prevention and safety protocols. How are you exactly following them? And as Mr. John Poiman of the EPA just mentioned, the matter of disposal of medical waste, including nose mask, hand gloves, medical overalls and tissues in order to contain the spread of the virus. We're having children who are likely to be um, exposed uh, as a result of that. So uh, we're looking at the questions of child safety 
and advice to stay away from planning, uh, playing with used PPEs. How are you dealing with your PPEs in your home? I've seen people who just pick their mask and seem to throw it anyhow. How can you do it and do it well? Uh, waste management services and the handling of waste as well. So let me begin um, with um, uh, Dr. Odame. First of all, must we be concerned about waste, particularly waste as a result of the pandemic in our society, in our homes, and the country at large? Yes, uh, thank you, Samson, for the opportunity. And, uh, thank you to uh, the good people in NCCC for granted this very important forum. I always keep on saying that if you do the right thing at the wrong time, it's wrong. And if you do the wrong thing at the right time, it's equally wrong. So if you the do right the thing, right thing at the wrong time, it's wrong. That is wrong. Yes. Okay. And if you do the wrong thing at the right time, it's also wrong. Okay. So getting the right thing, being done at the right time and at the right place, is what makes it right. Right. And I think the timing is apt mm. uh, for this occasion. Great. Because uh, society is grappled since the Spanish flu. We are grappled with one of the most major. Oh, so who knows? Maybe this may be the Third World War. Mm. The most major pandemic that has grappled all nations that we confront on a daily basis. And you ask the question, is environmental governance important? Absolutely. Why am I saying that? Clearly, we are generating infectious waste at an alarming rate. If you care to know, PPEs are one of the items we bought most importantly as part of this weapon of again, the Arsenal against this battle. Mm. And I'm sure in Joy FM studios, you are very clear that almost everywhere facilities are asking for PPEs. That's right. I see it has become the, like the major weapon for the battle against coronavirus. Not just PPEs alone, the coveralls, the face masks as we are wearing, all the various things we are asking for. And this clearly points to the fact that if we're generating X number of waste prior to COVID, today is SQ. So clearly, it's important, it's come at the right time, and how we confront it is key. Thank you. Let's have also Sanam, who is the engineer and who oversees a department in such an important institution in the waste management process in this country, like Zoom Lion. Tell us, what are we looking at when we talk about waste within coronavirus, the coronavirus pandemic at this time? I'd like to begin by saying thank you to NCCE, Arab, EU, and the multimedia for such a platform like this to discuss such an important issue. I'd also like to say good morning to our executive chairman and then Mrs. Labi, our CEO, and the management of Zoom Lion. Yes, with regards to your question, um, actually what is actually happened is that this COVID-19 pandemic has, has, brought, has brought a lot of difference in terms of the type of waste that is being generated now. Now we have the infectious component of the waste actually increasing, escalating. And before COVID, research indicated that 15 to 25 percent of the waste that was being generated, especially from healthcare facilities, was infectious. Okay. Now we have this percentage increasing to about 40 to 50 percent due to the increase in the the PPEs being used, the test kits. Now we can see numerous te uh, testing being, te uh, being taking place. Now all this has increased the infectious percentage of the waste that is being generated. And now it implies that there's, there's supposed to be a capacity of um, technology being brought in place that could actually handle such a waste. But it's unfortunate that in Ghana, we do not have such a capacity. We only have one centralized medical waste treatment facility in Accra here, serving the greater Accra region and a few of um, the regions around us, Volta region and then Eastern region. Now looking at this, it's presenting a challenge to us mm. because the other regions are disadvantaged. Mm. They also need such a facility to help them out because they are also experiencing the coronavirus pandemic. So now with this, it's, it's a call to attention that something needs to be done immediately for us to be able to contain what is actually happening. Mm. Otherwise, the situation might be worse. All right. Um, 
Franklin Kujo, who is the president of Imani Africa, uh, joins us via Zoom. Thank you very much for making the time, Franklin. Good morning, uh, Samson, and uh, good morning to your guests, uh, fellow panel members and uh, viewers as well. I'm sorry, I, I totally, I didn't forget, I'd, 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 I'd slept, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I understand you have a very busy schedule and therefore things can happen. But first of all, what for you is the significance of this discussion? Why must we be talking about good environmental governance and the coronavirus pandemic? Well, thank you very much. And ordinarily, we should be talking about the environmental governance any day, anyway. Uh, it just so happens that the because we've been laxed, uh, because we've not taken these um, issues about environmental governance properly, uh, what it means is that our problems have compounded. As the gentleman from Zoom Lion just said to you, there's been increased use of um, PPEs. Uh, I mean PPEs and other 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 related materials, mm. COVID related materials. Mm. And so what it means is that your waste uh, levels, your waste management uh, situation has been compounded. And so, yes, it is an opportune time to have a conversation like this because it reminds us of what we've been failing to do all the time. And I'm sure before the program started, you may, you may have related what the president said concerning the, I mean, uh, uh, sanitation and keeping Accra as one of the cleanest cities. I haven't seen any of that happen yet. Uh, and so to think that a conversation about environmental governance or management uh, is, is crucial is, is an understatement in this very important times. And okay. so um, that's what I've got to say. But I also have to just add quickly that it looks as if the approach we've been adopting um, is not necessarily helping us. It, it looks as if we are overly focused on the public sector trying to solve these matters for us. When waste is waste is an independent uh, a problem. And when I say independent, I mean human beings generate waste. And so human beings must be made to account for the waste they generate and pay for them. Of course, public authorities must ensure the infrastructure that, uh, that should exist in order to safely you know, uh, manage this waste or, as it were, turn it into some proper use. Uh, but to the extent that um, not many persons uh, see these uh, as a personal decision because the state doesn't seem to give that credence, fiscal credence, and I mean in terms of taxation or in terms of the ability to pay, um, the state hasn't made it overly mandatory to ensure that P persons. Uh, who generate waste uh, yeah. are made to pay for them. Right. And so it's become a bit of a conundrum. And yeah. I'm sure as the conversation uh, moves, transits, uh, right. we'll talk about options for optimizing our environmental governance. Right. And so uh, Franklin Kujo brings our attention to a pledge that the president has been pursuing that we need to make, for example, Accra clean. And we know that the country spends billions in trying to get its act together as far as managing waste in this country and even in Accra alone is concerned. Nonetheless, we have made very little and minimal success over the period. Now that we have COVID-19 come in and the generation of waste, particularly medical waste, is more than doubled. What are we looking at? Dr. Dami, from where you sit, as you prepared for this particular dialogue, what consumed your attention as to what we should worry about and what ought to be done to remove the worry? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Samson, once again. I think for, from where I sit, it's about the first question that have we put in place the right policy architecture as a people to allow for this worry to be taken care of? 
So if you take it from the very beginning, I mean, when I say policy architecture, I'm looking at it from all the various levels. Mm. First, give us, give us an understanding. Uh, give us some graphic of how you have, you know, perceived and looked at the reality of the waste that we are going to, we are generating as a result of uh, coronavirus. And then let's come to talk about whether or not the architecture exists to deal with it. What yes. are we looking at? So clearly, like I told you, we are generating waste materials now at a very alarming rate across almost our 58 treatment centers across the country, in, in addition to our, some of our isolation centers. That brings it out of our 72. And all this place, you're talking about continuing change of PPEs, coveralls for all the medical staff, even our hand washing devices, sanitizers, disposals, all the various medications we are using for uh, our COVID patients we have now. And for information, after speaking now, we have close to 21,077 confirmed cases. And we've had about 129 deaths. So also even talking about our mortuary staff who are working on these dead bodies, moving them in and out and all that. And all the things they are also using in there. So clearly, if nothing at all, we've had about 21,000 confirmed cases of all the staff. Not to talk about all the real armies we have across from village level to community levels, moving across the nook and kind of this nation doing what we call contact tracing. So clearly, this is waste at an alarming rate. Mm. And well, the good news is that we are also alive to it. And alive to the fact that we need to put in place the right architecture. So maybe I'll wait for your next question and then I'll dwell a bit on a bit of the policy architecture. Right. Is it fit so, for purpose or not? The president has given us about fifteen or so addresses so far. Mm. And at each time he tells us how much the country is committing to bring in PPEs as we speak because universities, uh, senior high school, junior high school, certain categories of students have re re resumed. They are having to be supplied free of charge PPEs. At least each, each student is supposed to have three nose masks. That should give us a picture of the enormity of the waste to be generated. That's Beyond that, you're talking about the medical officers who have to use most of what they use, which is not reusable. That's correct. So that's a lot. That's correct. Senam, from where you sit, how can you, how can you bring that graphic to home? Thank you very much, Leia Samson. Yes, so look, looking at this, um, before COVID, nationally, the whole Ghana, we were generating about um, 24,224 tons of waste. Now, research has indicated that um, from the international waste, that 20%, there's a 20% increment of this tonnage of mm. waste mm. because of the COVID. Now it implies that with this, we need, we need to be alert and tackle the issue head on. If we sit down without doing anything, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be taken unaware. Now this situation has brought to the fact that, um, especially the infectious component, because we are looking at potentially infectious waste. Right. We don't know the, actually the person using it, we don't know whether the person has COVID or not. Mm. When the person is disposing it off, the person just throws it away like a general waste. But then there should be a system in place that to bring about waste segregation. We need to segregate the infectious aspect from the general waste aspect. Mm. There's a principle that if you mix the non-infectious with the infectious, the whole waste is regarded as infectious waste or hazardous waste, which implies that all this waste needs to be treated. Mm. And when, when this comes to board, it means that there's going to be higher cost for the waste treatment. Right. So the waste segregation needs to be put in place so that we, we, we use a little, relatively smaller amount of money to treat that small component mm. as compared to mixing everything up and then treating the entire waste. If we don't do that, it means that we'll be exposing ourselves to the infection. Right. And this, my, as, as Ilya said, might worsen the case. And we might not know what, how to even handle 
the situation in nationally. April the president announced that we were going to produce locally 3.6 million mm -hmm. of PPEs on our own this will stay here in this country mm. yes. um, we have had medical practi pra practitioners and people involved in the uh, medical or health you know um, system suggest at certain points that they are looking for some PPEs and they don't have. They don't have yeah. I want us to pay attention, to draw our attention to how to manage the waste even in the circumstance. So let's begin and get directly into our homes. Mm -hmm. okay. What do you have to say? Okay. Actually, um, infectious waste management is a chain on its own. Right. Okay. It starts from waste generation. So the person generates the waste, for example, no smacks, you use no smacks. Now from waste generation, you go to waste segregation. Waste segregation is where you, you separate the waste into it's from dependent. But in, the, in our case, we are looking at infectious and then non-infectious. Mm. You could go further to, to plastics, metals, etc. But our focus now is infection because we are dealing with corona. Right. Now, in our homes, currently most of us do not have separate beans for mm. our waste. We right. just use one bean to collect everything. Every day I remove my mask and I just dump it into my waste bin. A liner. So everything is being mixed up. So over there, for example, just to say, if you are positive, it, in, it implies that all the waste that will be in it will be contaminated by the nose marks that you place in there, mm. making all those waste infectious. Oh, I see. Yes. So it implies that in our homes, we need to get a separate bin for those kind of items. Nose marks, the tissues that we sneeze in, mm. anything that comes into contact with our body fluids, all those things need to be separated. The same, to, uh, the same can be applied to the institutions, workplaces, etc. Not to, uh, especially to the health, health sector. They actually are, they are supposed to do that. Yeah. So from the waste segregation, you go to the um, transportation of the waste. No, no, hold on there. Now, uh, Dr. Adame, I, I'm in my home. Yeah. I'm removing my mask. And he's saying I need to separate where I dump my mask from where I dump all other waste. All I know is I'm dumping it into the bin. Mm. Um, the, the waste collectors will come and take it, go throw it away. Mm. So why should I bother separating them? Yeah, so uh, something, thank you. But this is the kind of work we've done with, I'm sure it's aware of the care, healthcare waste management policy mm. and the guidelines. That was a joint effort to the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Environment, Science, Technology and mm. Innovation. Yeah. Really, most of the questions you ask borders even in, within the remit of the Ministry of Environment and Science Technology, they had a full remit. So because for the healthcare, where I sit, we are more worried about the health facilities and what goes into it. But what we have agreed in principle is that we have different, we don't want to call labeling mm. in the guidelines. There's a red, there's an orange, and there's a yellow. Yeah, right. Yellow is for hazardous waste, mm. and okay. red is for very hazardous waste. Mm. And then we have the brown. So the principle is that everything, like he's saying, uh, Senam said, anything that has to do with contact of body fluids, especially in our times now, we all know we are not in normal times, as we've all kept on continually saying, mm. has to go into a separate bin, in okay. quotes. Let's say a separate bin, in quotes. And then our use routes, our normal plastics, our normal papers we squeeze in the home, should be separate. Because I'm also taking an opportunity to educate Ghanaians. Mm. Because it's, it's very crucial, not just for you, but for both of us. But you see, in that bin, your child, your whatever, can push his hand. Because if it's a hazardous waste bin, you even keep it in a place that might not be accessible to the little children okay. who are crawling on that floor. Right. Mm. Who don't know what is hazardous mm. and what is not hazardous. They mm. touch anything. Okay. Anyhow. Mm. So that's the principle. So, and that's why I said the, so the first principle is the principle of waste segregation. Mm -hmm. So now it becomes a health facilities. I can make mention of Gan East. It's a separate container for all the waste that has to do with hazardous waste and okay. includes all the things that have to do with COVID, i.e. the face masks, all the rest that are used. So you just mentioned children, yeah. and that is very important uh, part of our discussion today. We have people who remove their masks, for example, because they are not ready to dump it yet. Mm. They've started the day 
and they haven't finished with the day, so they are not ready to dump it. Or they are using mask that is reusable. Mm. So they pull it off and hang it around a table or a chair or in the car, and they hang it around maybe the gear or something like that. How dangerous is that? Yeah, it's very, and that's why I say we should also look at our circumstances. For if you have a home that has little children, under five, even under 10 years, mm. these are kids whose cognitive function are not really up to the level where. So you may have to take extra precautions. Because you see, the thing about COVID that I also want to put on record is that even the science of the COVID spread and it's still evolving. So I even tell people that the precautions should be double. Because more the scientific community comes to say this, more is that. Mm -hmm. So if we have children, then we need to take the extra precaution, even if it means that we are putting somewhere in a locked place where the kids are out of reach of the children. But not to, let's say, you put on a bed where the child comes to lie on top of you. Daddy, you come from work. Mm -hmm. And then he touches that. Sometimes even not with, without your knowledge. Right. But kids sometimes they think they are asleep, they are awake. Mm -hmm. They come when you are asleep, maybe you put the nose mask on and asleep. Mm -hmm. He sees that face mask as a toy. Right. Thinking it's one of those little toys mm -hmm. that you press around. Mm -hmm. And maybe even start licking the nose mask. Mm -hmm. So please, I think we are appealing to a Ghanaian public that Look at your circumstances, especially right. if you have children, mm. go the extra mile, mm. and let's take extra precautions. Great. So you were about to talk about, um, um, Sanam, you were about to talk about the transportation or the conveyance mm -hmm. of the waste. Um, if you, we remove it from generating them in our homes, our offices and hospitals and so on, they must be conveyed from one point to the other. How can it be done in a manner that protects us? Protect us. Thank you very much, Dr. Samson. Yes, so when we come to the waste transportation, when we're talking, we, we, we talked about the waste segregation. Mm. Now, in waste segregation, you separate the waste into different color-coded liners. Mm. Okay, so with our color codes, black is for general waste, then yellow is for infectious waste. Okay, so at the storage, that, the external storage, your, bin, your bigger bin that you have outside, one bin will be allocated for general waste, one bin will be allocated for, general, uh, for medical waste or the infectious waste. So all the yellow bags will go into the infectious waste bin. Mm. Then all the black bags will go into the general waste bin. There will be two separate transportation systems. One truck, which can be a compaction truck, could, will come around to pick up just the general waste. Then a specialized vehicle, which is for the infectious waste. Now I say specialized because the specification of the truck must be, one, airtight. It should be a leak-proof vehicle. It should be of a form of a cargo-like nature. And if, if you want an ideal nature, the, the, waste, uh, the truck should have a cooling system. The cooling system will, will freeze the waste at a, a temperature of about 4 degrees Celsius. What happens is that at this temperature, the microorganisms are not able to proliferate. Mm. So do not be multiplying which may result in odor, emission, and stuff. If, if it's a healthcare facility, for example, the pathological waste, which is the tissues, uh, organs, and stuff, it helps to reduce the decomposition rate during transportation. So this is the ideal way that we need to operate. So that, that infectious waste vehicle will come at a separate time scheduled to come and pick up all the waste. The waste, the, those that will be handling the waste, should be in the appropriate PPEs. Mm so that they themselves will be safe. Because you are picking waste that is potentially infectious, so you need to protect yourself for. Do we have an idea the number of waste collectors in our community who are not formalized, like Zoom Lion does, mm. yeah. who are part of the chain in the transportation of the waste? Do we have an idea? Y yes, please, yeah. What percentage yes. of the waste is scattered by them yeah. as compared to what uh, Zoom Lion does. Yes. Uh, it's a, there's an interesting scenario that is actually happening. Now, I hope most of you have, have heard of this boiler taxis exactly. and tricycle operators. Right. Actually, they, they form the informal sector. Mm -hmm. Okay. And from records, there are about 3,000 operating in the system because they have some associations that they formed. Right. Now, this informal sector currently is picking about 40% of the waste. 
they are able to go to the slums. They're able to go to areas that are tracks. They are dealing with about 40% 40% of the waste. Of it, yes, because and you see them often. Yes. You don't see them even with hand gloves. Nothing. And if they have some, they will not treat when they use them. They come into your home, they pick the bin, they just dump it, and you see them use their bare hands, bare hands. try to compact the waste. Yes. What do you say about that? Yes. So this is actually giving us the picture of uh, the risks that we are actually um, facing. These people are potential transport uh, or transporters of this in quote coronavirus because they go from home to home. Mm -hmm. They might go to a positive home, take the waste, then put it on a bin that is in quotes um, negative. <laughs> okay. In, in quote negative because as we know the virus has the potential of taking on on the hands because of the lipid interaction between the virus and our pumps mm. creating the covalent bond so when it touches another surface it's able to transfer to that surface so the owner of the house just comes to pick up the, the bean into his home in case the person doesn't wash your hand it implies that he's also, he's also going to spread it on door handles and extra mm -hmm. um, presenting risks to the other occupants of the home so this question has really drawn attention to the fact that something needs to be done about this informal sector. Okay, so now hold on and gather your thoughts more clearly on how this group that is taking care of about 40% of the waste and they are not formalized like Zoom Lion is and other waste management companies are, um, what advice they can get so that they protect themselves first and protect all of us, uh, they come to our homes. How will they do that? Now, let me bring in Franklin. Now, uh, Franklin, as you hear um, Senam and Dr. Dami on the questioning of the waste that is generated in our homes, particularly the PPEs, and in offices, and in the hospitals, and how this is disposed of, what comes to your mind? Well, um, that's quite sobering um, to think that we have in, uh, first of all, not only do a lot of people understand the what we are dealing with in terms of environmental education, um, it's one of the challenges we have. But on top of that is the, is the, is the tacit, if you like, um, approval of the state of things by our state actors. And why do I say this? Um, yes, maybe the NCC and a number of other civic actors may be educating people about cleanliness, uh, but it also takes a lot of um, financial muscle to be able to, as it were, manage this waste properly. So I can understand the challenge with how people are treating waste, indeed treating environmental uh, situations from their homes. Uh, that is that that part of the education must be done. But the other part that is significantly missing is the way these waste eventually get disposed. So you can understand that from the home there may be challenges, but there's a much bigger challenge when we eventually have to dispose this waste, however unsegregated the waste really are. So that gives that takes us to what the current situation really looks like and why we think that the MMD is who have been empowered, who have been part of the, the, the if you like, the uh, public service duty in order to manage waste. Uh, unfortunately, just see them as public service mm. and, and an unrewarded one. So to the extent that the fees, the levies that are supposed to be paid in the safe disposal of waste itself is called into question. So we have miserly, you know, uh, fees that are paid. And when miserly fees are paid, what it translates into is that it leads to um, a, 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 some sort of deficit attention given to the infrastructure that should lead to the waste safe disposal of waste. So I'm talking landfills, I'm talking even roads leading to landfills, which That's are right. not properly constructed. As we speak, I think I'm told that about three or so landfills in the country, if not within Accra, are, are not op uh, in operation. Mm. And the roads leading to them themselves are decrepit. Now, on top of that, some of the compactor trucks that have to safely dispose of this waste um, 
are, are not in, we, don't, we do not have them in sufficient numbers. And even when we've had them in numbers that private actors like Zoom Lion may have invested in, they do not get their returns in record time, if ever at all, because of the absence of fiscal incentives. You know, what we are dealing with is a hydra-headed problem, and I'm just speaking to the public policy aspect of it. All right. And to think that there are about nine various levies and fees that um, waste management companies have to pay in order to import compactor trucks and, on, uh, and, and cumulatively comes to about 22% in terms of taxes. Um, when you compare that with the uh, profit margin of just about 20%, which gets eaten away by all these levies anyway. What it means is that they are left with just a 2.5%, if you like, rigor room in order to do anything significantly. That is, includes investing in R&D uh, and then investing in you know, uh, operations that will scale up their, their activities. So you have a situation where on top of the individual disinterest in managing waste or treating waste properly, uh, you have a public, you know, vehicle which does not seem to prioritize um, interventions and in, in waste in the in the same dis disposal delivery of waste. Mm. I would have thought that by now, uh, this country would be interested in asking private actors to invest in setting up, you know, biomedical waste disposal uh, uh, was equipment. Uh, sorry, uh, facility throughout the country. As the engineer has rightly said, there's only one in Accra, and it's serving close to 500 hospitals. And just about 200 hospitals use this facility. So it tells you that in this corona times, what it means is that the increased activity, the increased waste that we see, uh, would definitely not be treated by these entities. Mm. But, so if these entities were mandated to use this, the autoclave, um, I mean, this facility, what it means is that we'll be minimizing the the the, the unintended consequences of a uh, right. of a track. Okay. Um, yes, uh, and, and Franklin, you you bring you bring on, you know, an aspect that also is quite scary, and you see, as he spoke about these um, uh, collectors who use tricycles and others, and as we are told by Senam they are dealing with about 40% of the waste from our homes, our offices, and so on and so forth. Franklin spoke about the conveyance process. As you take them, you see them, drive them, and these are in the open. Their vehicles or their tricycles are open. You see flies all over them, and they drive them through our homes, main streets, markets, before they take them to the final destination. Dr. Dami, what would you say about that? Yeah, so, um, something, I think that's why I was trying to spend some time to talk to you about the policy architecture what, that, that happened. Because I think we did the recce and clearly we realized that these were gaps that we had in the system, like in engineering those. Medical waste was not something we had really categorized very clearly. And it wasn't an area we had gone into very rapidly. But as the evidence started coming up, so actually in 2015, as a ministry, we started a project with UNDP. We've been doing major trainings for uh, engineers, and them as a part of. But clearly, one of the things we said, the ministry starts with both public and private, all actors, and including civil society. So based on that, we develop what we call the healthcare waste management policy and develop clear guidelines. And based on that, for me, in the policy remit, policy doesn't end with the document. It ends with implementation. Mm -hmm. So it didn't end there. And like I said, I know we've had a couple of trainings with them. As I'm even speaking to you now, there are trainings happening for hotel staff on how they handle medical waste and how they categorize them. Hands on. And then... Yeah, but but here we are talking about the reality, yes, where they are coming into our homes. They are not telling anybody that, you know, because of coronavirus, separate your waste, and when we come, let us have the mask and other things you use because of coronavirus separate, because these are highly infectious. And then we put them in our general dustbins, 
they pick them up, they dump them, they use their hands, their legs, you hear them, you see them stepping on them, and they are driving these away in a manner that potentially exposes everybody on the way to the dump site. Yeah, so that's, that's why I'm coming to, and that's why these trainings have become very handy. Because like I say, most of these are informal sector before, like, look, let me also cut some weight. So he gets some tricycle, he also starts picking some things in. Well, you and me know the informal community we have in this country. But like I always say, you don't push them out of business, you train them to see how they will still be able to put something on the table. And that's why in the training we are taking cognizance of the informal actors. And like he said, I know the work that has been going on, trying to work in hand in hand with the informal actors. Actually, there's even a conversation before we entered the room, I was talking to Senna, where Zoomlang is even going to try to partner with some of these informal actors. So they cut the waste to their level and then they pick it up from there. And now we end up training them into categorization, a bit of the medical waste, a bit of what should happen. I can give you practical examples of what's happening in some facilities now. Mm -hmm. Like you go to Ghana East now, there's a separate waste bin for uh, yellow. Yeah, you mentioned informal, that. Mm -hmm. informal, all the hazardous infectious waste goes there. They even have on-site autoclave right there. So they are able to take it through the autoclaving process. What we've realized, said or rather, is that some of our people have some of the old incinerators. But unfortunately, since the Stockholm Declaration in 2001, which came into effect in 2004, on persistent organic pollutants, those incinerators are not able to combust at beyond 800 degrees Celsius. And they have some of them have very low chimneys. They end up releasing a lot of persistent organic pollutants into the atmosphere. And that's where the other issues come in. The whole issues around the law issues are about cancers, mm -hmm. health yeah, conditions, yeah. lung conditions, big issues around climate change, all kinds. So we are trying to discourage the use of those old instrumentals. Mm -hmm. Zoom Park has a very modern, I think it's even a hydrocleave. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. like a hydrocleave yeah. addition, which is able to combust at those right temperatures and based on that we So a lot of action is happening now, but I want to agree with you fully that these are still early stages. And then we need to ramp up beyond that crowd mm. a bit more rapidly. As a doctor, yeah. my question is, what's the risk mm. in this process of collecting and disposing of the waste? And we have not even talked about where they go and dump them mm. and what happens after they have been dumped at that place. And remember, we're talking about good environmental governance and the coronavirus pandemic. Mm. So it's not just about picking the waste and go dump them anywhere and we are okay with it. Yeah, so it's, it's wrong. I mean, basically, but I also, I'm also real practical to the fact that some of this point in the business, they don't even know about all these health effects they are just picking. And it's actually, if you actually move out of Accra, even in Accra, some part of Accra, you have all these informal actors, some of them don't even have any company, no name, who pick this, as even, even as they move it forth along the street. Yeah. So this is why we'll call on the local governments because, you see, the good thing is that we have the laws to put a bit of these regulations in place. The Public Health Act is clear of 2012 at 851. That's why the Section 5 is all devoted towards environmental sanitation. So this is where the local government service and also actually the environmental health officer has been mandated to move into homes to sometimes even accost some of these individuals and suggest some penalty and take them through training. And all that. So we really want to okay. call that a bulk of the work mm. in this area goes beyond the health sector. Mm. The cost of our local government service, please, let's go back. We have appropriate laws in this country right. to make progress. Right. So uh, Dr. Dami is talking about the laws. Yeah. On this matter, I'm very reluctant to be quick about the law and cracking the whip on this informal group that is cutting as much as 40% of the waste in our homes and offices and in our community um, because we know that you, the formal institutions, the biggest one like Zoom Lion, you don't have the capacity to take all our waste from our homes. And that's why they are important. Mm. Some waste can sit in our homes for as long as forever until these people come in you know, and provide the needed intervention. The question I asked you earlier, and you had to hold on for us to return to you, was what advice can we give to minimize the risk that this 
manner of waste collection poses first to the collectors themselves, the homes and places where they collect this waste, mm -hmm. and the process of conveying the waste to the dam sites. Thank you very much, uh, Samson. Yeah, so um, with regards to the first question you asked, now um, there's this association, ESPA, Environmental Sanitation Providers Association. Yes, they're actually trying to regularize this informal sector people. So they are registering them, getting their details, and they organize periodic training for these people. But you know that with this situation, it's, it's both sides, the leader and then the person. It's, it's both responsibility to actually do what is right. So the leaders are doing their best mm. to actually get these people on board, to organize them, train them for them to be aware of this. But their attitude is also another thing. You know, just to say, or pardon me to say that... This the, sort of training has been going on for how long now? Oh, to the best of my knowledge, for about two years now. About two started. years now? Yes, it has And started. they are still cutting the waste. They don't cover them. Yes. We yes. see flies follow them yes. wherever they go. Attitude no and issue. we see the waste sometimes there's some accident and everything falls on the road. Oh, yes. And you see them literally use their bare yes. hands to pick them back into their tricycles. Yes. Let, let me tell you an, 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 an interesting situation. You know, these people, when they go to dump, okay, they are charged per trip, okay? Right. So they try as much as possible to load their little tricycle with as much waste that they can. So they can get a lot of money, then pay less at the end point. Mm. So that's what actually results in they falling down. You can see some of them toppling even upwards this way. Right. So they, they, you train someone, but the person's attitude to actually implement what you've trained is also another thing. And these people are not, and quote, the educated ones, they are those that are actually trying to do their own things. So they actually, you talk to them and they... So what should we be to. doing? That's really what it is. The yes. solution is mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. yeah. in, in, in the pandemic, coronavirus yes. pandemic yes. era, we need every solution and advice we can get because they expose all of us. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So actually what we can do is to rather provide strict enforcement of exactly. the laws. Strict and the word is strict. If we catch you doing the wrong thing, you pay a penalty, like what the president has, has just done. If, if, if you are caught outside without the nose marks, you see how intensive the penalty is. Something like that should also be implemented. And I think when we get two or three people, as an example, the rest will be careful and know what is actually happening. And just to add, with respect to capacity, you know, Zoom Lion has the ability to even expand to cover up the whole of Ghana. Mm. But the market is open to all. Everyone needs to come in to have a share, provided you, are, you have the adequate capacity to do so. You know, we've taken the front line of even venturing into this medical waste management. We're the first, first people to actually do that. And, and, and it's a high risk area, as, as uh, Mr. Franklin said. Return on investment is so slow. Mm. As at now, we've not even recovered one CD. Okay, so Zoom Lion and others are doing this in a more formal way. Formal way yes. You have your workers who we see they are offering in overalls. Mm. Some of them have hand gloves that they use, yes. and you see them use all sorts of protective gear. Yes. So beyond Zoom Lion, how many other waste management entities do we have in the country that is taking care of the 60%? Uh, actually, I, I, I don't have the figures of head now, but mm. they, are, they are from the records that I saw recently, about 50 also have registered mm. with the ESPA with regards to formal sector. Right. Is, but their capacity is not enough. That's why you, you, you don't see them visibly mm -hmm. operating. Right. Yes, that's why. We see the informal the ones informal. a lot more around our homes than we see yes. your vehicles. And the reason is that now they are making more money because of mm. the areas that they're able to penetrate right. into. And you know, they don't have schedules and stuff. They right. just move anytime, anywhere mm. to mm. just pick up. And, okay. I, and, I, and I think they're also doing a good work in quotes That's right. with, with respect to the waste collection. Mm. And w what we have also done is to, as a formal sector, to help is to provide waste transfer stations. Mm. That place is where the waste collectors bring their waste to dump 
Mm. And then we rather take the waste in huge volumes to mm. the landfill site, okay. which is located. Right. Let me get to uh, Franklin now. And if you are just joining us, this is the National uh, Commission for Civic Education's National Dialogue. It's held uh, quarterly, and this is the fifth uh, virtual Arab National Dialogue on good environmental governance and the coronavirus pandemic. The NCC is basically seeking to assist you with education to know how to manage your waste, particularly related to, particularly related to the use of your PPEs and their children around the home and of course their children around, how you generate the waste, how you get the waste disposed of in a manner that does not put you at risk. So the hashtag is hashtag NCCE Dialogue on Joy. And this is supported by the European Union. We are coming to you live from the Joy News Channel and also on Joy 99.7 FM and all our social media platforms are activated. We uh, will take questions from you as well. So if you have any uh, questions, uh, send them through any of our platforms and we'll share them with our guests for some answers. Contributions will also uh, be taken. Now, uh, Franklin, once again, um, how can we begin to look at the solutions? And I'm looking at all of these waste generated and taken to the dam sites, the environmental impact on all of us. Well, thank you very much. I think technology, by and large, is something we should be looking at. But but technology, before we get to technology, and I suspect, as um, the good engineer has suggested, there are very few companies that have the capacity to, as it were, invest in the modern technology. Mm. So there's one part which means they have to invest in it. You need high, you need deep pockets to do that. Um, the challenge, as I've related not long ago, is that when you have now invested in these rather very, um, if you like, uh, capital intensive enterprise, you need to have your rewards back. And rewards here are not necessarily because you want to appropriate the rewards and chop. It's to appropriate the rewards and extend the uh, skill so that you can take care of all the nook and cranny where there's, there's waste that has been generated. Nobody could fault this smaller abobo yes or whatever we call them, from getting to getting us uh, getting the waste from our homes, it's simply because, as uh, Dr. Dami said, the 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 policy architecture for the infrastructure, unfortunately, uh, is not coherent, and so you need bits and pieces of all of that. Look, uh, Amma, who happens to head the ESPA, Environmental Services uh, Providers Association, mm. has clearly that since 2014, there have been 22 waste management companies that have gone under. Now, to think that waste is a crucial matter, and these companies are investing out of about 40 or so, and if you have more than half of them go under, actually tells you how precarious the situation is. So you need to start looking at public-private partnerships that encourage this. But when you've done this, the law should not be failing you. Law from uh, uh, observing bylaws that ensure environmental cleanliness at individual and uh, if like corporate level, we should do that. But we must ultimately invest in the safe disposal of waste. And safe disposal does not necessarily mean throwing it away, but turning waste into proper organic, you know, materials. I would have thought that by now, the MMDs, um, some of them could come together. Uh, agglomerate and ensure that the some private partnership, public partnership projects uh, to erect facilities that would definitely lead to ensure that waste is safely disposed will be done. I do not think that most of the MMDAs have the capacity um, because they do not generate enough capital in the way, fees, uh, to, be, to go solo. But Definitely, private sector can do that. And uh, at the risk of sounding, you know, I'm quite capitalist of in thought. <laughs> I think that the state cannot do these things by itself. 
the state only appropriate. Look at how many times the president has said, oh, through my finance minister, I would ensure that incentives are given to private companies. It's never happened. Look at the number of times these have been, the promises have been made. But the state has been able to appropriate funds. And when these funds are somehow, whatever, uh, uh, what's it called, allocated, you don't see the effect uh, on the ground. So oh. we need to ensure oh. that the, the structures that are in place and the National Sanitation Ministry must get serious. This whole habit of setting up National Sanitation Authorities and setting up a panoply of, uh, what's it called, uh, actors, um, bureaucracies. It's not the way to go. They should not be treating waste as if it's their domain, per se. Waste could also be managed intelligently by a combination of private partnerships. And I think that is where we need to go. Okay. 22 companies cannot die just like that. Mm. It doesn't speak well. It doesn't bode well for cleanliness at all. And, and particularly, it thing, may appear that in this particular time, we ought to act with a sense of agency and to mobilize as many of these formal institutions as we could to ensure that the risk is reduced. Now, I would need you to organize your thoughts as to the quick steps that must be taken immediately, immediately to assist, to ensure that uh, the role of public institutions, the EPA, the Ghana Health Service, sanitation officers, etc., in the nation's fight against the pandemic and the maintenance of good environmental governance practices is intact. The management and reduction of the effects of the production and disposal of PPEs and cleaning agents um, on the environment is also in such a way that it doesn't put us in further risks. So uh, I think this is where we should be getting into now. And I'd like to uh, begin with uh, Dr. Odame. What must we be doing immediately now to ensure that we are reducing the risk that managing waste as a result of, of the pandemic and during the pandemic um, does not you know, expose us a lot more to even further risk. What can we do, practical steps, that the state, the EPA, yourself, the Ghana Health Service, uh, perhaps the, I've heard you mention many times the local government, right? What yeah. should be done? Yeah, so I think, like it's a first sense leadership. And like somebody said, uh, Singapore has said that we are in a time that is now the, the world of the unknown unknowns. And I mean, this was said by one Singapore lives young. And I like that word because we are in a world that is now volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. We all don't know tomorrow how this coronavirus is going to turn out. So what is very clear is like what the president has kept on saying, that we are handling the coronavirus in the spirit of all on board, whole of government approach. So it gets back to your question. How is the Ministry of Environment ensuring that it's part of its mandate? is playing it and playing into the whole. How is the local government? I keep on saying the local government because all the bylaws for enforcement are quietly enshrined in the local government. There's so much power that our district assemblies hold. To even enter in people's homes, to even go and inspect and whether there's mosquito larvae, collection of pool of water. It's amazing the kind of bylaws we have that empower these institutions to go in there. And then the Ministry of Health, we on our side, the hospital side, like I said, we've done the guidelines, we are doing the trainings. Now it's about the enforcement. And that's what we are doing in our facilities now. And trying to scale it up. I won't say we've done it all. We are still in processes of making sure we scale it up in the segregation. We are still providing these autoclaves to various facilities. Like in Cape Coast Hospital Hospital, now, now they have one. Mm. Confinancia has a proper incinerator that can burn at those levels. Kofodia in this region also has an incinerator. What we've done is that we also alive to the fiscal space constraints. So we've provided tricycles to some of this, we've well trained them to pick from the satellite uh, facilities, i.e. health centers, community health work, and then bring it up to the major facility where the combustion can go on. Those are the complete sets, even have a second equipment that's used for shredding, that then reduces the waste before then Zoom Park picks it up. 
and then he moves to a major site. So this was, but the major thing is all of us in the communities, you and me, Samson, mm. we also need to be vigilant and make sure we don't throw things away anywhere, anyhow. Okay. And um, abide by the rules of the state. Mm. In that way, then we all help ourselves. I always say in coronavirus, is two things. Either you're infected or you're affected. So if something you have it, I'm affected. If I have it, I'm infected. So anyhow you look at it, it's infected somewhere. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, Senam, practical steps that all the important stakeholders yeah. in and protection of our environment. And now it is a matter of urgent need to protect us because of the health implications. Yeah. What are you looking at from where you sit from Zoom Lion? Okay, so the first thing is, um, as, as Elia said, mm. the other regions do not have centralized infectious waste treatment facilities. So they are disadvantaged in this whole situation that we are talking of. So the first thing to do is to f immediately go into those regions. And this is possible through PPP. With the private investors, we need to we need some support from the government to actually do this. And also the enforcers should also do their job by bringing all the, especially the healthcare facilities, on board to patronize the services. Because the challenge on the ground is the facilities complain of inadequate funds for waste. They'll tell you they have, they've not paid for their drugs, how much more waste. So there needs to be a support system that could actually help the private investor when he's going into such a thing, will be motivated, just like Mr. Franklin has, has, been, has been saying. Yeah. Mm. So this is where the next step that needs to be done, and it needs to be done, if today okay. it needs to be done, because it's very urgent. Otherwise, so we're talking about the state getting into PPPs yes. with the private organizations, organizations yes. to do what exactly and where? Yeah. To establish centralized medical waste or hazardous waste treatment facilities in each of the regions. How quickly can these be done? Actually, practically, within a month or two, such facilities can be established. Right. So far as the funds is made available immediately, mm. it can be established so that we can save the whole region. Because we are all Ghanaians. We all need to benefit from this, not only get our courage. Right. OK. So uh, uh, Franklin Kujo, because of this pandemic, we need this as urgently as we can. What else do we need and to ensure that Cutting the waste from the point of collection to these places will be managed in such a way that the environment is not hurt and our health, you know, is not at risk. Well, at this juncture, I suspect that the, there's been a legend of uh, interventions and suggestions. Even what I said is not original with me. Mm. Uh, it just makes uh, sense that waste should be seen as a business. And until we wish to send us a business, um, the challenges we're having would, would, would come to, would not, would, I mean, the challenges we're having will continue. I think uh, Dr. Dami makes a point about leadership. And I recall in one of my conversations with Dr. Nsiansari not too long ago, um, when I pointed out the study we conducted in 2016, May, uh, on, on the effect of biomedical waste, while well, the way biomedical waste is handled in the country, he replied immediately and said, this is, of, this is so close to his heart and that it is more needed right now than ever and that anything that ought to be done, he would ensure that it's done. You see, that's clearly the shift there immediately. I suspect that uh, maybe this was not contemplated as part of the coronavirus, you know, tax force, uh, uh, what's it called? But again, there was... a. Uh, there was a, 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 an aha moment which Dr. Nsias I realized, and I thought that that could have been a good starting point. I still believe it's a good starting point. So the combination of medical factors, a combination of uh, uh, infrastructure issues, but at the end of the day, unless we to seen as a business, and the business of business is business, whereas all those partaking in the business are rewarded in one way or the other, None of this would go away. You mm. cannot have a situation where um, companies are, have to come up with almost 22% fees and levies and, only, and, and then only make a margin of almost 2.5%. I 
as I said, that is not so anybody. That's not how anyone who wants to treat this uh, waste as a business okay. would, would be with you. Mm. We should stop this endless cycle of every Saturday national sanitation cleaning, cleaning. Those things are quite emotive and actually quite annoying. I think we should invest in large things, cover drinks as well. That's what this, the, the public sector should do. But the private sector can come in mm. and ensure safe disposal, and and, 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 and and that's the way to go, really. All right. Um, uh, thank you very much. Very, very interesting and practical solutions to assist in making sure that we have good environmental governance, particularly in the age of corona um, virus um, we are we are supposed to get some of your views and share them with everybody else if you have a question or one um, but let's bring in at this time the mr samuel asari ekwamwa who is the deputy chair chairman in charge of operations of the ncce uh, mr ekwamwa uh, thank you very much for joining us All right. Uh, so we will get back to uh, Josephine Nkrumah Rada uh, uh, because we don't have Mr. Samuel Asari Ekwema, uh with us. So we'll get back to Josephine. And after having, you know, listening to all the uh, views that have been expressed and the practical solutions that I've been giving as the chairperson of the NCC that is leading uh, this uh, education uh, session for all of Ghanaians, what her remarks will be. Um, if you have anything to say in a minute, gentlemen, uh, I give you the opportunity to say so. Yes, so start with Dr. Adami. Yeah, so I think I still want to end with a quote I said by the Singaporean, that we are in a world of the unknown unknowns. We all don't know tomorrow. As I sit here, I always say, coronavirus is no expert. Every single day we are learning something new. So this means we need a mindset to be very inquiring, to learn on our feet and to make sure every day is a learning journey. And environmental governance becomes very key. In the SDGs, that's a, our social contract for the world now, it's our people, it's mm. our planet, and it's mm. our prosperity. Okay. We need to keep our planet safe for tomorrow. All right. And environmental governance is key. Okay. Thank you. And like you said from the start, that if you did the right thing at the wrong time, you have done it wrong. And if you did the wrong thing at the right time, you may have done it wrong. But this is the time that you at the Ghana Health Service, as in government, will like to buy into the practical ideas that have been floated mm -hmm. so that the right thing is done mm -hmm. now. Yes, Senam, in some 30 seconds. Yes, so what I also say is that um, to, to overcome or to fight this corona, it's a um, we need to couple good leadership with personal responsibility. If these two are done well, we will both win the battle and then we'll all be safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Franklin Kujo, um, President Imani Africa, um, you had very insightful you know, uh, contributions to make. Uh, do you have some 30 seconds to share any further points? Well, 30 seconds and spot on. See, look. As I said, I, I would still in the realms of business. This habit of government seeing big ticket transformative companies as a threat must stop. And I, I'm going to go all out there and vouch for Zoom Lion, in spite of all the problems they may have. But Zoom Lion is a big, is a giant when it comes to waste management in the country. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, somebody says they are too big. And so even though they are doing noticeable interventions in trying to help us keep our environmental challenges, they need to be break, bro broken, broken into pieces. Okay. When you start breaking big ticket transformative companies into pieces, you end up with all the things you're having, all these kinds of uh, bobo years running around collecting waste here and there. Mm. You don't get any traction. So I think we should focus, as I said, the business of business is business. Mm. Policymakers, government, public public officers should be interested in building and and, and, and ensuring companies that flourish All right. in doing things. Thank I you. don't see why we shouldn't have waste in facilities. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Franklin Kujo. And you have been watching and listening to the National Commission for Civic Education's 
national dialogue. It's quarterly dialogue. And um, today's has been on good environmental governance and the coronavirus pandemic. My guests have been uh, Senam uh, Tenge, who is uh, an engineer and manager, Medical Waste Department of Zoom Lion. Dr. Emmanuel Odame is Director of Policy Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, Ministry of Health. And of course, Franklin Kudio needs no introduction. He's the president of Imani Africa. Now, let's get back to um, Madame Nkrumah, who started the program with us. Madame Josephine Nkrumah is a chairperson of the NCCE. Uh, what will be your uh, final remarks? Samson, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, thank you. It's been an amazing discussion with our panelists, and indeed it has been insightful. It has opened our eyes to the other side of the pandemic and matters that we should take um, very seriously and matters that are urgent for us. For us, it tells us that there's a lot more we can do as ordinary citizens in Ghana in our homes. We must begin to adopt waste segregation for particularly our disposable masks and gloves that we use. Right. It's become even more imperative in the workplace to adopt such waste segregation practices, particularly because we're seeing a lot of workplace transmission. And this issue, these, these discussions have raised that critical issue that workplace um, human resource managers and administrators must begin to put in place measures that ensure that we segregate um, waste at the workplace. Right. I think the broader policy issues as, as well have been spoken about. Waste management, the kind of waste management architecture that we need to see in place. We need to ensure that we have a proper legal and regulatory framework in the informal sector, as we have noted, because there are certain places that it is clear that the big trucks like the Zoom Lions can go, but we need to find a way to get rubbish disposed of. All and right. for this reason, it's important for us to see that. Okay. Lastly, I think we must have in place the kind of policies um, that ensure that there are incentives that reduce tariffs and taxes on the implementation of, sorry, for the import, importation of waste management equipment, as we find in the agri sector. All right. These are the things that will yeah. encourage the, the private sector to go into waste management and see it as the business to make business right. for business. As Thank said, you. Franklin Thank says. you. Thank you so I very think, much. And Miss Justin well, Nkrumah is a chairperson of the NCCE, and this has been the NCCE's uh, National Di Dialogue Series.